Hundreds of thousands of people walk through these gates every year into the town of Capernaum, the hometown of Jesus, the center of his Galilean ministry. Now what is it that brings people from all over the world to this land and to this town? Who is this person who healed with a touch and brought deliverance and strength and life to all the people in this region? What is it that has attracted the world to this town? Join me today as we walk into Capernaum and discover the hometown of Jesus. Capernaum is a city of destiny. It wasn't by accident that Jesus came and settled here. It says in Matthew 4 that after he was rejected in Nazareth, he moved down and came by the sea, just where we are, to a small fishing village named in Hebrew, Kfar Nahum, the village of Nahum, someone, a nameless man named Nahum. And he settled here in order to fulfill a prophecy, it says in Matthew 4, a prophecy from Isaiah 9. It says, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and those upon whom the shadow of death has come, a great light has shone. And it was from here and from this village that Jesus began to preach the message, repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now a long time ago in about 720 BC, Isaiah talked about this very area, this very village. And he said the first parts of the 10 tribes who were gonna see the invasion of Assyria and Sennacherib, those Jewish people who were the first to see exile and darkness, that one day God would have mercy on this region and bring a great light to the very same region. And so even the choice of this humble fishing village was set out in scripture and part of the strategy of God to bring a great light to a very humble place. When Satan tempted Jesus, he offered him the glory of all the kingdoms of this world. And yet Jesus did not give in. He left the desert triumphant and came up to this area here. And he chose a simple, small, tiny little fishing village of poor people. You can see the black stones here. This is field stones, very rough. There would have been thatch over these little houses, a lot of extended houses, what we call insulas here. So there would have been perhaps a family with a mother, a mother-in-law. In one of these little homes, Jesus would have gone in, coming from the synagogue area just behind me, and he would have put his hands on Peter's mother-in-law and spoken a word of healing over her, and she got up and served them right here in this area. Some of us live in gated communities or in the suburbs or maybe in the center of a city where you may not even know your neighbor. But uh, in the time of Jesus, that's not the way people lived. This community here of Capernaum was a, literally a small town where everybody lived on top of everybody else. You can see here the walls. In each little walled courtyard, you would have had a family, maybe some animals mother-in-law on the other side, next section, relatives, everybody lived right beside each other. There wasn't a deep sense of privacy here, but everybody knew everybody. What a forum for the gospel to go out, because here what was done in one house became the talk of the town, literally.
Every pastor, when he candidates at a church, he hopes that his first sermon is gonna make a strong impression. Well, this was true with Jesus when he gave his first sermon in the town of Nazareth. People got so excited that they tried to kill him and throw him right off the cliff on the edge of town. Then he comes down to Capernaum, comes in on the first Sabbath into the synagogue and begins to give his teaching. And it's a wonderful teaching. People really like it. And then right in the middle of the sermon, somebody stands up and begins to scream and says, Jesus of Nazareth, I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. This was a demonized fellow. And again, although what he said was true, Jesus didn't need testimony from a demonized man. It wasn't going to bring any credit to God. And so he spoke a word and the man was thrown to the ground. And people said, what is going on here? There's the works of this man and the words of this man, and both come with authority. And they were amazed. This was the response of the heart of the inhabitants of Capernaum, right here in the synagogue. Now, we're standing here looking at this synagogue that is a little bit later than Jesus' time. You'll notice the stones are all white limestone. This was built in the Byzantine period. It's called the White Synagogue. But below it, where the black basalt stones are, the foundations, that's from the time of Jesus. And again, the synagogue would never move around the community, especially a poor fishing village like this one. So we're looking at the foundations of the synagogue from Jesus' time, a poor fishing village where he gave his first sermon recorded in Luke chapter 4 and then this later synagogue from Byzantine times that pilgrims would come to and get a, a more beautiful more exotic view of the synagogue from the first sermon of Jesus Christ. wanted to point out something of interest over here. There's a pillar here which mentions the name of Zebedee and John. This was a column dedicated by someone to put in the synagogue. Now in Jewish tradition, especially from Second Temple times, the time of Jesus, you would have the same name repeating. So you'd have Gamaliel, the son of Simon, the son of Gamaliel, the son of Simon. In Matthew chapter 4, we hear about James and John, who were the sons of Zebedee. And here you have three, four hundred years later, the same testimony of Jesus affecting this community, that there are still Jews here, still living in this town. According to Pliny and according to the Talmud, there are still Jews who believe in Jesus Christ in this town, even by the fourth and fifth centuries. And this column is a testimony to the continued existence of descendants of Zebedee, James and John, the sons of thunder. You know, God thinks of such practical details. He's an incredible strategician. When he told and prophesied to Isaiah that the Messiah would come and make his home by the sea, by the way of the sea, it says in Isaiah 9. Part of the reason was that one of the main superhighways of the time came right through here. Here we see an example of that with this Roman milestone showing that the way of the sea, the main Roman road, came right through here in Jesus' day, right by this village. A little bit here on the left, we can see some of the uh, olive industry that was part of the area here. So it was, again, an area that a lot of people traveled through, and the message was widely disseminated. Now, in this area here, on this way of the sea, is called Galilee of the Gentiles. Jesus showed something about the calling that God gave to the Jewish people. Back in Isaiah 49, it says that the Jewish people were created to be a light to the nations and a servant to the Gentiles, to give the light and message of God to the whole world. And the greatest Jew of all time, Jesus Christ, was the one who showed that with great excellence from this village. There was a man, it says in Luke 7, who was a Roman centurion, and he had a Jewish servant who was sick and about to die. He himself did not come to this village because he felt that he didn't have access to the covenant promises, like Paul says in Ephesians 2 and 3. And so he sent a group of Jewish elders from this town. And they came to Jesus and they said, this man has a servant who is sick and he is worthy that you should heal his servant because he loves our people. 
and he's built for us the synagogue. They were reminding the Messiah of Genesis 12, 3, where it says God is going to bless those people who bless the Jewish people. And Jesus responded, he said, I'll be happy to go. And on the way from Capernaum to this man, the Roman centurion sent him a messenger and said, please, Lord, I'm not worthy for you to come into my house, but I am a military man. And I take orders and I give orders and people obey them and I obey them. So just say the word and that's sufficient. And that's what happened then. Jesus said, I have not seen such great faith even in all of Israel. What a high compliment he gave this Gentile soldier who was even part of the occupation troops of this land. And it just goes to show us this incredible heart of compassion that the God of Israel has not only for his own people, but to the very ends of the earth, preached, lived, and demonstrated by Jesus here in his hometown of Capernaum. You know, Jesus was such a realist. He went right for the heart of people. Right here at Capernaum, there was a scene once when there was a, a man who was a paralytic. He couldn't move. And his friends came and they ripped apart the roof, which was thatch, and they laid him down through that, kind of lowered him down with ropes. And then they brought him in front of Jesus, who was surrounded by people in one of these small houses. And Jesus looked at this man and said, your sins are forgiven. And some of the religious hypocrites of that day said, who is this man who says this only God can forgive sins? Now they made the right conclusion, only God can forgive sins. But it's a lot easier to say I can forgive sins than it is to say take up your bed and walk because then you have to prove that you have the authority behind those words, the words and the works of Jesus. So what happened at that point is Jesus said, why are you thinking evil in your hearts? And this again is pointing to how the fact that Jesus wants to reveal what's in our heart, his coming to us reveals what's in our heart. That's what he cares about. That's the whole message of God. What's in our heart and how God can change that and make it into something beautiful. And so this man then received his healing. He stood up and walked out and the people who were there had to then deal with the fact that Jesus was not just a normal human being. He was a man who spoke with authority the words of God. Now right here also in this area of Capernaum, there was a tax collector and this man was actually a collaborator with the Romans in collecting taxes. His name was Matthew and Jesus called him. Isn't it interesting that Jesus called a zealot and he called a tax collector. These people hated each other and yet both of them were part of this group of 12, these disciples who followed Jesus wherever he went. And Matthew held a huge party somewhere right in this area there and he invited many of his old friends from his previous time. They would have been other tax collectors, sinners, perhaps prostitutes. And the religious people of Jesus, they got very upset with him and they said, what type of prophet are you that you're allowing these sinners to come here? And Jesus spoke to them straight from the heart of the Hebrew prophets and he said, you don't understand the words of God, I wish you did. Because the prophet said, Chesed chafatzti velozevach. I've desired mercy and not just sacrifice. He said, if you could only understand those words. A lot of the times we know how to work with people who look righteous, but inside are not righteous. Jesus said, it doesn't matter if you look like a sinner on the outside or you look righteous on the outside. I'm looking on the inside. And it was here, right in this area of Capernaum, that Jesus focused on the essentials, on the issue of not only a kosher appearance, but a kosher heart. As Jesus walked through the town of Capernaum, there are two stories told in Mark chapter 5. 
one of a woman who had been sick for 12 years and the other one of a 12-year-old daughter. Jesus was walking along and the leader of the synagogue, a man named Jairus, or in Hebrew, Yael, came to Jesus and said, please come heal my daughter. She's just at the point of death. And as Jesus came to him, she ran into a woman. He ran into a woman along the way, just in the crush of people. And this woman wanted to get healed from an issue of blood that she had, something that was totally debilitating in Jewish culture, would have made her unclean. And so re she reached through in the press of people and she grabbed hold of the fringes of his garment. And she said, if I can only touch him, maybe I'll get healed. And what happened is he turned around, he said, power's gone out of me, what happened? And this woman was full of fear and trembling. And she says, it's I who touched you. And Jesus said, your faith has made you well, go in peace. And so there was a start with fear and then she moved into real fear of the Lord here, right in this area here among the crowds of people. And then finally, he comes to Jairus' home. He walks in and people start mocking him and totally full of disbelief. Once again, Jesus is going for the heart of these people. And so he says, don't be afraid. Just like that woman was afraid out in the market. He says, don't be afraid. Just believe. Focus on the heart connection with God, trusting him to be able to do these things. And so he came, put his hands on the daughter. And this 12-year-old daughter who was dead now came to life. So here's a woman with a 12-year-old medical condition and a young girl, 12 years old, who died. Doesn't matter whether you're old or young, just not to fear and trust in the power of Jesus Christ who can raise you from the dead. You know, walking through the streets of Capernaum reminds me of a story that happened in this area here. And that is when Jesus and his disciples were eating. And he was being watched by the religious leaders of his day who weren't so sure if Jesus was kosher, if he was the real Messiah. And they noticed that Jesus' disciples were not following the traditions that were being developed about exactly how to eat, how to pour water on the hands and various man-made traditions which were becoming, as it were, traditions of God. Things that men had decided that God had never said, but through time were getting misunderstood to have the force of the authority of God. And so Jesus was asked, why are your disciples eating bread before they've poured water on their hands according to what the rabbis are teaching? And Jesus began to focus on the heart of man. This is a thing he loved to do, to talk about what really goes on in the heart. And he said, you know, when you eat food, it goes into your body and it comes out and that's the end of it. He said, but what's really important, what really turns a person unkosher is not necessarily what goes into them, but what comes out of them. So he said, out of the heart, come issues like murder, jealousy, stealing, fornication, adultery. This is what comes out of a heart of man. That's what makes him unkosher or unclean before God. This was a very novel idea. People were focusing on the externals and often thinking if they only did all these different points, that was sufficient for God. How much you give, how much you bow down, how many pilgrimages you go on. Jesus said, no, he said, the Father is looking for people who are willing to give what's inside as a sacrifice to God. That's what God finds as a kosher sacrifice. So this focus on the inner side of man, on the inner heart, that's really the cry of the prophets and the cry of the God of Israel. And right here in Capernaum, it's the cry of Yeshua. Not what looks good, but what is good from deep within. The structure that I'm looking at here is called the House of St. Peter. There's actually a lot to commend it archaeologically and historically. 
Pliny the Elder talks about the fact that during the reign of Diocletian, there were Jews who believed in Jesus who were actually descendants of the same family of Jesus living here in Capernaum. The archeologists, the Franciscans who worked here years ago discovered plaster on the walls here. And some of it was written in Aramaic, Jesus save us, which means there were Jews who still spoke Aramaic who still lived in this area already two, three hundred years after the time of Jesus. So Peter lived here, his mother-in-law lived here, and you had all the stories going on about his mother-in-law being healed, about all these different things happening right in this area. Some of you may think with me and wonder with me, why did God choose someone like Paul, a brilliant scholar, and send him to the Gentiles? And take someone like Peter, who was a simple fisherman, kind of hot-headed, little bit impetuous and take him and speak to the whole Jewish nation. I think because God often offends the mind to reveal the heart. He'll choose common people, simple people, and because his power is made perfect in our weakness. You know, there's a lot of emphasis sometimes on uh, people getting special revelation from the Lord or people having special encounters and, and God is able to do all sorts of things. But the thing God cares about most is not the unusual. He cares about what goes in on our life on a day-by-day -day basis. He takes real people, simple people like you and me, and he calls us to serve him. And here in this town, Jesus, who could have been in the biggest capitals in the most glorious areas of the world, came to the most humble town in Israel, to Capernaum. And here, for three years, he ministered to fishermen, to farmers, to peasants, to ignorant people. Because God places a value not on the finesse and not on the riches and not on the power, but on the human heart. And here in Capernaum, we come once again to focus on this Jesus who cares about our heart, so much so that he would be willing to live, bleed, and die for us in order to change that heart and make us acceptable and kosher to the God of Israel. Capernaum was a town that saw a lot of miracles. Jesus performed more miracles here probably than anywhere else in the New Testament. And yet what's interesting is not everyone believed in him. Although tremendous things have been done here, people raised from the dead, people healed, people delivered. Jesus ends up saying in Matthew 11, he says, Capernaum, you could have been exalted to heaven, but you will be abased even to hell. He said, if Sodom had seen the miracles done here, Sodom would have repented. So the point here behind us, it's not just the miracles which are the issue. Jesus was focusing on the issue of the human heart. If Jesus came back today to America or to Israel or to any other country, would people receive him because of the fact that there would be a tremendous display of glory and power? What Jesus is looking for is repentance. He's looking for a heart which will bow before him and say, uh, not by myself, Lord, I can't make it by myself. Each one of these miracles was crafted to push people in the direction of saying, I do not have what it takes. I need the grace of God. And so as we see people calling out to God here, the response Jesus was looking for, the purity of heart he was looking for, is simply this. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's what God was looking for then in Capernaum. That's what he's looking for from us now. And as we move into the days when the Messiah quickly returns to this earth, how much more will God be looking for faith on this earth?